Hi, welcome to this session of Inclusion Fusion. We're here to talk today about um, we know we should, but how. Um, how to get unstuck in special needs ministry. And with us is Amanda Mooney, who is trained as a special education teacher and who is also the principal of religious education at St. Gabriel Parish here in Northeast Ohio. And we want you to know also that the, on the Inclusion Fusion website, there are handouts that go along with her presentation. So if you'd like to pause now and download those so that you have something to look at as we go along, you're welcome to do that. So in your title, Amanda, you talk about um, the description as helping people to get unstuck. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, how to get unstuck? Yes, well, I have often found that as you are working with um, ministries and volunteers, that everything seems to be going along really well until something happens and then it's just not anymore. Um, I remember an experience when I was a much younger um, <laughs> volunteer myself and I had just finished graduate school in special education. I thought, I just, I know what I'm doing. I know how to teach kids with disabilities. But then moving into that whole church stuff, how do you actually teach church stuff mm -hmm. to kids with special needs? So I went to this conference that I was so excited about thinking I'm gonna learn some great techniques. And the presenter did a great job of making me feel motivated and excited that I should be doing it and that it was a worthwhile way to spend my time and that God was just smiling down on all of my efforts. And I left there feeling really good about that and so excited. And then I realized, I still didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to actually fill that hour of time, and that was still scary. And so I felt very stuck and not sure, okay, what do I do with these kids sitting in front of me? How do I keep their little bodies moving while trying to talk about something so abstract? What do I do with these textbooks that I've been given that I'm told I have to use? How do I make that real for these kids? So that was a place where I thought, what do we actually do? I'm an action person and I needed some real, real live things um, to know what to do. So now that I'm on the other side of it a little bit and part of my job is finding the volunteers and um, working with them, I don't want anybody else to feel stuck too. So our job then is to go that next step of getting unstuck. Um, in ministry, oh, now I have to go back a little bit, I apologize. <laughs> um, they continue, when you have a volunteer, they might start out really excited because they don't feel stuck yet. And they might stick around for a while, but then sometimes they leave when they do reach that point where it goes from being fun to feeling like this became something much more and bigger than I ever understood what to do. So we wanna keep our volunteers happy. We all know that happy volunteers um, stick around and then they learn from their own experiences, they become stronger in their own faith, and then they make for happy families. And then happy kids and happy families are people who come back to our church and to our programs, and that's what we want. Often for, um, I know in, at our church, a lot of times in our, you know, our Sunday school programs or our religious ed programs, their time with us is their only time maybe their time that they're involved in the church at all. So it's really important that we make that time with us special and that they feel welcome so that then they will expand and become more involved. So we keep our volunteers happy, the children leave feeling happy, which makes the parents very happy, and then they're going to come back. So if they're coming back, we need to know what to do. Mm -hmm. So that is our next place of, of, of finding out what to do. Now that all sounds very simple at first. Well, you make your volunteers happy, your families will be happy, and then life will be all good and happy. Everybody's happy, right, and everything is just perfect. It isn't as simple as that, but we can break it down to make it simple. And that was, I know what I needed when I was first starting out as a volunteer was, how do you break this down for me to make it more um, manageable? Now for our purposes today, we're going to assume that um, you already have everybody on board, that you've already talked with all of the powers that be, and that everybody is, is all set and ready to include kids with special needs and they, they value it and they know that it's an important thing to do. If after this session you find that that's something that you still need help with, there are lots of great sessions mm -hmm. um, with Inclusion Fusion and even just through contacting Key Ministry to get that kind of help if you're still looking at making sure that you're getting everybody on board. Um, but we're gonna assume that you already have that piece done. Now that isn't to say that you aren't going to have some volunteers that are a little reluctant or nervous, or that are gonna say, isn't, this, isn't she gonna look hilarious when this all comes crashing down <laughs> and isn't going to work out at all. But when you prayerfully and flexibly go about the process, we really can break it down so that you can, you can do that. So we've already determined that our happy volunteers are gonna make happy children, and then they're all going to come back. Mm -hmm. 
So because they're coming back, we better we better get ready for them. So we have um, we better get busy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm wondering, um, Amanda, you, what is yeah. in this great big box? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. This is a box that people bring with them to Sunday school as a volunteer or a catechist. That's the Catholic word for Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. We call it catechist. They have a box, and you might not always see the box, but this is going to represent our box, and they bring it with them. It's beautiful, don't you think? It's lovely. I yes. think so, too. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It is not only beautiful to the eye, it's strong, mm -hmm. sturdy, and it's a fairly good size. You can actually fit a lot of stuff in this box. Mm -hmm. Volunteers often bring a box of stuff with them. Would you like to know what's in the box? I Rebecca? would love to know. I'm so glad you asked. Yeah. You have fabulous questions. <laughs> in this box, you're going to find the religious education textbooks, the Sunday school curriculum, cute and fun activities that are time tested and have been fabulous and been used and wonderful for decades, along with a class roster of well-behaved children <laughs> who can adapt to any of your fabulous ideas and will happily work any worksheet that you put in front of them. Doesn't that sound great? It does. It does. It sounds easy and fabulous and it fits so wonderfully in there. Right. Exactly, right? I mean, who would not want right. everything to fit all neat and tidy in a little box? This is the recipe for success, wouldn't you say? Yes. Unfortunately, there are two problems with this. I know, it's sad. I wish there were no problems. I wish we could say and cut that we were done and we've solved all of the problems. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. Here's what happens. The box is so full with all of these fabulous ideas and lesson plans mm -hmm. and things that you've already done in the past that there's no room for new things. And even worse, there's no room for the other children that have actually signed up for your program. The actual real live children that <laughs> don't act perfectly every second and might not enjoy that worksheet you put in front of them and aren't interested in your puppet that's in there that you've been using for 20 years. So it's full with a lot of stuff. Nobody can get in and so the lid is stuck. Hmm. And so no one will fit in. So here's what happens. These new kids and these other ideas are left on the outside, trying to peek in and figure out what's going on, but they left are left not connected and on the outside, which I think, you know, represents how sometimes our kids with special needs do feel. They feel like, ooh, I'm just kind of outside looking in. I'm not interested maybe in everything that just is sitting in this happy little box, and I'm not even like maybe some of the other kids that you've already decided will fit in this box. And so, that's, that's the difficult part. So right. our job, either as the volunteer who's all ready or the ministry leader, is to get that box, you know, get the box unstuck so that we can unbox God. You know, nothing is going to fit in there. We need room for everyone. God wants us all to be included. We want to make sure that we can um, serve everyone. And as pretty as the box is, God doesn't want us to all fit in there. And thank God for that because I don't know about you, but... Ain't none of my kids or my issues or anything that we have going on in our house is going to fit in this box. And to be quite honest, I'm glad. I don't want to have to try to cram my kids into this box, or I don't want to, them to have to feel like they have to get themselves crammed in there. Um, now, the problem with that is once you take the lid off, you're never going to get it back on. It's never going to go back on. And I know for some people, that's tough. <laughs> we want things to feel very neat and tidy. And as an educator myself, I know that that is a common characteristic mm -hmm. of educators, of teachers. We do. We want our bulletin boards to look lovely, and we want our lesson plans to be neat and tidy. And unfortunately, sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. We all know life isn't that way, and it certainly isn't in children's ministry or in ministry with kids with special needs. But that's okay. When you decide to let go of the lid, mm -hmm. unstick it, and work outside of the box and unbox God and come up with new ideas, everyone's going to be happy, happier. And again, as we said, we want our volunteers to be happy. Happy volunteers equal happy families. And instead, we might just have to drag a big bag behind us instead with all of our things. But our happy volunteers will gladly pull that along and help us carry those things because it will work for them and um, everyone will, will do well. So, are we ready to unbox God? I think so. Okay, so we are going to get started by addressing three questions. We need to ask them. Um, these are the three questions we need to ask when getting started um, with either adding in families with special needs to the programs that you already have existing or if you're going to begin a new program for children to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through each one now. 
Again, this is where your packet would come in handy that you're gonna be able to have, have those downloaded for you. So here are the three questions. Who are the families that need assistance and where do we find them? How do we find them? What do we do with that information once we have it? And how do I get, how do I know where to place them and what to do with them when we have those children? So the first question, who are the families that need assistance and how do we find them? Now for some, that might not be an issue. You might already know and that's why you're here because you have these children that are identified with special needs or you've had families come to you and say, we need I some need help. help. Exactly, <laughs> I need some help. We don't know what to do. And you're gonna work within the programs that you already have existing and that is, that's great. Um, others of you might feel called that you know that need is out there and you know those families exist mm -hmm. because you might know them in other circles of your world but they aren't coming to church. They aren't um, being a part of things because of those barriers. So whichever way you are doing it, um, we're gonna be able to help prepare you. Now, my church was very, is very, very, it's a large church in Northeast Ohio, and to be honest, I was nervous to start out. I was afraid to ask. It was kind of like, be careful what you ask for. My first fear was, what if now I've pumped everybody up and gotten them so excited to help these families and we ask and nobody comes forward. I'm gonna feel pretty bad about that. But scarier was the thought that, what if I ask, we get so much response and then I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So again, that was making me feel stuck. So I knew I needed to break it down. So that's what we're gonna do now is we're going to unstick ourselves so that we don't feel overwhelmed. Um, I went to a key ministry event and I heard Harmony Hens Hensley yeah. talking about the fabulous 1,200 person prom that they do for adults with special needs at Vineyard Church in Cincinnati. And that sounded amazing and wonderful and so exciting, but it made me sweat thinking right. about it. It was so huge and so overwhelming for me to think about how could I, my own little person, do something like that. So my little small thing that came from that was doing a mini vacation Bible school. I love that idea that you do. You know, vacation Bible school was already existing, so I didn't have to try to build new curriculum or come up with a new idea or a new theme. Mm -hmm. And we already had a special needs program. So we just started by asking those families. We already knew who those kids were. I could pull from those volunteers. We knew what their needs were. Mm -hmm. So it was manageable. It was doable. It was exciting, but we could handle it. I felt okay about that. And for us, those 15 children, it was worthwhile. So never get caught up in thinking that if it isn't big, it's not worthy. We right. all know that even if just one child is touched by what you do, you know, it's, it's worthwhile mm -hmm. and, and, and God is, it's God's work and he's so proud of us for it. So I began by putting um, announcements in our bulletin and here's what you'll have in your packet. It's just a, was one of the versions that we did. And we did it a few, a few different ways. We put it in um, our weekly bulletin or your weekly newsletter mm -hmm. as an insert and it appeared just like that. Um, we also, um, you could even just send out a questionnaire to families who are currently enrolled. So if you're nervous about kind of putting it out there on a large scale, mm -hmm. just talk to the families that you already have enrolled in your programs and ask, is there something more we could be doing to help you? Um, we also put this in a letter, a mailer, to our families who are already registered in our program, who um, were receiving that mailer with information about orientation. So they were already mm -hmm. gonna receive that packet, and so this was some additional information. And my contact information was on there so they could look it over and if they felt that it was something that they wanted to talk about, they could do that. Right. Um, the last play thing that we did was we put it as an, an email, and as contact, and it went out to all of the families of our church mm -hmm. that had children between the ages of 3 and 18. So these were either families that were currently enrolled in programs or were eligible to be enrolled but right. weren't participating for whatever, whatever reason. reason. Mm -hmm. Right. And we got the best response from that mm -hmm. because that was something that they could just click on. If you have additional questions or you have information you'd like to share, click here, mm -hmm. and it went directly to me. Within the first 24 hours of that, we got seven emails back, wow. which seven might not seem like a lot, but it was so fast, mm -hmm. and they were instantly saying, thank you for asking. Yeah. We were looking, we were wondering, we didn't know what to do. We heard from a family who said, my child with Asperger's hasn't participated in any programs in over two years because it was too difficult. We knew we needed to do something, mm -hmm. but we didn't know what. So our parents get stuck too. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing to remember. We feel stuck of how to help and they feel stuck too. Mm -hmm. So we can work together, yeah. you know, to, to, to deal with that. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, the other, we had people just wanting to tell us things like, my child's on medication and it's going to be wearing off by seven o'clock at night and I'm not sure how they're going to do, 
you know, with your program in the evening? Can you tell me maybe about some options or would I be able to have them leave early? Those kinds of things. Um, we had families say, you know, will you just contact me? I wanted to, to, to talk in person. And some of them really weren't things that we necessarily even needed to do anything about. They just wanted to share mm -hmm. a piece of their story, of yeah. their family story. And to be heard, I'm and sure. To, absolutely. And you could just hear in their voices the the relaxation of mm -hmm. just feeling like they were heard. Mm -hmm. And whether and that you cared enough to ask. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that we could then, if it was just, we'll pray for you, let's touch base again. Mm -hmm. I as you said, just asking was huge. And we're beginning to create that culture of caring, which was really big. So again, don't get caught up in feeling like you have to do some huge, big thing. Okay. Your first step might be just asking. Mm -hmm. And if a few families hear you ask and they know that you care, and then you do something with that information, that will spread. Mm -hmm. They'll tell others, oh, well, just call, call that church. They'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. They'll help you out. Um, so we, we put that in our mailers. Then another thing that we did was, again, for our families that were already registered in their orientate, in their packet that they received where they fill out, you know, consent forms and that kind of thing, they received um, an information form. And this is something that well, a lot of churches already do, that, you know, tell us about your child. Right. Do you have any allergies? Are there any medications? Very necessary, but just normal things that families are used to filling out. Mm -hmm. But what we added to that was, tell us about possibly their educational needs. We put a little checklist there with some common disabilities. ADHD, autism, Asperger's, anxiety, you know, anything like that that they wanted to, you know, just tell us and let us know. Then we left it open. Other family issues or concerns? Is there anything else that you want to tell us that you think would be helpful mm -hmm. for us to know to help your child? And it really was amazing, the response that we got. Some were, you know, she's allergic to bees. And that was great, mm -hmm. those little things. Another mom, it was just an allergy, but she filled up the whole page. So right there, that told me she's really concerned. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure then that I touch base with that mom to let her know that I heard her need and that we're on top of it. Because, you know, the amount of space that she took up telling us that, that told us this is a big deal to her. And you read between the lines. Absolutely, now. right. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we're, we're being, you know, considerate of that. Right. Others were, um, you know, please just call me. And again, they just wanted to talk about issues. The family, there's a pending divorce that the children don't even know about yet. Mm -hmm. And they're concerned about how they might react to that and how that might affect, you know, their behavior or things in the classroom. Also, we find that when family situations are going on and the family stops sending their kids, we don't know why. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to assume, oh, they just don't care anymore. They don't like us. They don't want to be here. And there really might be a bigger issue going on. Right. But we don't know what we don't know. So we have to ask so we can get that information yes. for them. Open that dialogue. Exactly. Yeah. And we have to be ready then to act. That's yeah. the other piece. If we're going to ask, then we have to be ready to do something with that information. So then they don't think we're just being nosy and that right. we just are, you know, wanting to gather some dirt or information on their families. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the worst things that could happen, I think, would be for a family to not, that for us to not know that something was going on and to then not be able to respond mm -hmm. kindly and compassionately. We're the church. That's our job. Um, so we have to just keep asking and not just ask once at the beginning of the year, but to keep asking and to keep touching base. Mm -hmm. um, so now that you've reached out and they've shared, they've told you what they want, you know, to want you to know, our second question is, what do we do with that information? Now be careful because this is another common place that people get stuck. Um, remember to work on a scale that's manageable for you. Don't think now that you have to create some brand new program or do something on a large scale. You're going to take that information to the next thing. Um, again, if you began with the families that you already have in your program, you might just be making some little accommodations. It might just be a matter of telling that volunteer or catechist this is what's going on with this family. Mm -hmm. Please keep an eye on the situation. Make sure that you're touching base with mom, those kinds of things. Um, and that's what we did with our one-day um, vacation Bible school. We just started with the families in our program. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, they told friends. So we had more, and we felt more confident publicizing it more because You'd been through it we'd once. been through it, and yeah. we, were, we were ready, and we were equipped, and, and it, it felt good. So mm -hmm. um, you don't feel like you have to get too big too soon. Every child counts, again, so you know, just, just pace yourselves. 
Um, it's p creating that culture of caring and taking action into your program so that they'll start coming. It's that whole, if you build it, they will come. You know, you, you plant the seed and it will grow and that ripple effect mm -hmm. of, the, of the puddle will, will go out there. So I provided an example um, in my packet of what a form might look like that you would use with families. But of course, you're going to make yours look however it needs to. And you might already, again, have something in place, which is wonderful. So after you've talked or you've received that information, you're going to follow up with that family. So whatever they've written down and provided, you're going to contact them and follow up with them. So then the next form that we kind of came up with was a planning form, or if you're an educator or a nurse, you'll know, it would be known as maybe an intake form. So this is the place where you're going to write down all the information that you gather. And we kept it very general. It looked very similar to the form that the families filled out, but that we, we could keep notes on there. And it was something then that we could go back after we got off the phone with them and just jot down our notes and kind of pull it all together. Um, but what's important is that each conversation must end with what's next. What is the next step? So again, we don't want to get stuck and go, oh my gosh, they just told me a whole lot of stuff and I have no idea what to do now. And so we'll just act like that never happened. You know? <laughs> Let's just pretend that didn't even happen. Doing what we're just, doing. Exactly, right. That seemed to be working. Um, so you might be sharing that information with that child Sunday school teacher or their catechist. It might be calling your ministry leader to make sure that their special seating um, that the parents suggested might be helpful at the next youth group mm -hmm. event that you were ha having. Um, it might be letting the pastor know because the mom said that she would love to maybe sit down and have some counseling time because of the divorce that's going to be going on. So it might mean a lot of things. It might not have anything to do with what you actually do in the classroom or in your program for that child. It just might be, I'm going to call this mom again in three weeks and touch base. Or it might be to go to the, to the teacher. If you are going to pass this information on to the teacher that's going to be working with the child, you would obviously make a copy um, for them. And then we provided a little notes page for them. And that way they could keep track of any additional information, anything that happened, if they tried something, how did it work, if the mom shared more information when she came at pickup time, that we could just keep a running tally of the information. Not only is that good for now, but again, as we talked about keeping our volunteers happy, mm -hmm. when this child transitions into another program, all of that past experience and past information is going to be very helpful right. for the next person. Yeah. Could you just say a few words about the confidentiality and what you ask your volunteers to do with absolutely, the information? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a confidentiality, a confidentiality agreement that we ask all of our volunteers to sign. It's part of their handbook that they receive. So and if that's something that you don't already have in place, mm -hmm. talk to your ministry leaders about making sure that you have that. Um, on the form that they receive, has all the information that has to stay in the folder that stays in the school building. And Nothing goes through email as well. Um, I get a little nervous with cyberspace that if something could end up in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So anything that was really, really um, sensitive, we right. did through phone calls. Right. So I share that information with the catechist or mm -hmm. the teacher through a phone call. And the catechists also know or the teachers know that um, anything that you would share in, e in email, even if it's something that seems really simple, you would use first names only, mm -hmm. and that this is information that's for our program and that it should just be shared for us, that this isn't something that goes outside of that. That's great. That's so important. Absolutely. And again, it's if we want them to ask, we need to be mm -hmm. considerate of what we do with that information. So the other part about the next step is it's okay if you don't know the next step. Mm -hmm. Again, don't get stuck on feeling like you have to have all of the answers right now. You may tell the parent, we're going to look this all over, review it. I'm going to talk to some other people in the program, and then I'll get back with you. It's okay to say that. And it's probably better to do that than maybe to offer something or say you're going to provide some kind of service that you're not yeah, even sure, sure you can yeah. really do. So if you're not sure, just say, I'm going to touch base with back with you. I'm going to get back with you. That is okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be that you're going to start with something very small and then build from that. Or it might be that you're going to try something and the mom is going to tell you that didn't work out at all. And that's okay. And then you'll try something else. Being a partner with the family is important. Don't, you know, we don't need to make them feel like we have all of the answers. We are we thankfully don't have to be the educators. We don't have to diagnose any children. Mm -hmm. We don't have to come up with any therapies. We're here to love them and support them along their faith journey. And that's really the parents' job. You know, mm -hmm. they have decided that they want their child to be brought up in the faith, and we're just here to support them. Mm -hmm. So ask them, what works for you at home? What kinds of things are they doing in your child's day school classroom that maybe we could incorporate? Mm -hmm. um, I think 
feeling like they do all of these great accommodations at school, what makes us think that those things wouldn't be helpful in our program on the weekends or in the evening? It might be something really small, but if we don't know, then we can't even try it. Right. And it might be a really small support, like having a buddy sit next to them to read the directions mm -hmm. so that they aren't nervous about having to do any reading or talking out loud. Mm -hmm. You know, all of those kinds of little supports. So talk with the family, be in community with them so that they feel a part of the team mm -hmm. and that it isn't something here, I've, I've I laid this all out, I've given you this information, now go make some magic happen. <laughs> and again, that's where people get stuck. The volunteers feel overwhelmed that you've promised them something mm -hmm. that they couldn't possibly deliver. And that's not our job. We're there as a support along the way, so we're gonna be able to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so next on your to-do list is to uh, um, communicate that to the volunteers, which we've done, we've talked about that, and we talked about the confidentiality. And again, we're gonna continue to circle back with the families um, as often as necessary. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just at the end of every class, the, the teacher just makes sure everything is okay, and that you continue to ask the family, is there anything else we need to know? Mm -hmm. Is there anything going on that maybe would be helpful for us to know? Keeping those lines of communication open. Right. Um, they might feel overwhelmed or afraid, and they might feel like they don't have the right kind of training mm -hmm. to do this. They might feel, well, how is this fair? That now you're asking me to do all of these extra things and all of these bells and whistles for this one child right. and not for anybody else. Um, you're going to let them know that you are going to support them. And if you are that actual volunteer who's saying, I'm nervous, I'm afraid, I think it might not be fair, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take a deep breath <laughs> and you're going to just relax for a minute and you're going to be comforted in knowing that you don't ever have to get the lid on this box again. It's beautiful, it's pretty, and you can continue to carry it with you, but keep the lid off, and we're gonna put some things in there and around it, mm -hmm. and you're gonna be good to go. So that gets us to our last question, Yeah, I think. so there is that last question. Um, once we have them, where do we place them? What do we do when we get there? And what do we even mean by place them? Right, exactly, I know that can sound a little like, like right, or that there are these, there are these things, that there aren't these real people. Where should we put this? What do I do with this right here? And again, this goes back to starting at a manageable place. Before you create an entirely new program, it might make more sense um, that what you already have in place will work with some accommodations and adaptations. However, if you discover that maybe you have several children with similar needs, that you might create a small group mm -hmm. for just those kids and you might have a teacher or two that's willing to take that on. Again, you're going to work with what you have um, and with the, the needs of the children that you have at the time. Kids are different, families are different, even the same child is going to be different six months from now, a year from now, let's face it, even a week from now. Yeah. So we don't feel like you have to create some brand new thing and then put your stamp and seal on it and say, okay, there, we did that. Mm -hmm. Because again, that's where you're gonna end up stuck because you're gonna feel like, there, I did that. And then when it's clear that it needs to be changed, you're gonna feel like it's gonna be difficult to do that because you just invested so much time and energy into creating another little box right. that everybody isn't going to fit in. So start with the children that you know you have, who you are mm -hmm. serving, and decide what needs to be done from there. Don't spend a lot of time and money making adaptations that you might not need. Um, and I've done that. I have definitely made that mistake. Um, again, that teacher mind, you might find something very beautiful online, or you go to a teacher store and something so adorable and precious or some material that looks so great. But you don't need it. It doesn't isn't going to serve the purpose of any of the children you actually have in your program. Um, so work with what you know you're going to be dealing with. Who are the kids that are actually in your program right now? And then the next year, you might need to go and buy that fabulous thing right. that you saw before. And the things that you created, you might not need for another year or two. And that's why we can't get the lid on the box because you're right. gonna end up with a lot of different things. But don't, don't find something for an imaginary group of kids that you don't really have. Mm -hmm. Work, again, work with you know, what you what you have. It sounds like it's really based on the relationship and the knowing of the child and their individual needs more than it is a checklist of, okay, I did this, I did this, so now we're done. It, Absolutely. It sounds like you really know the kids in right. your program and what and they And it's need. important to do that first, right? Mm -hmm. And to not say, oh, if I have a child with ADHD, I do this. I do this. 
that isn't the reality. And again, I think I keep saying it, that's where we get stuck because we go through that checklist and we create these things and then the child comes in and that isn't the reality. Right, and they still wiggle through their whole lesson. <laughs> right, and, you st and so you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like working backwards. We think we, should, we have to be all prepared and have all of our lessons and everything ready before they arrive. Mm -hmm. But it actually makes more sense to have some things, mm -hmm. but get to know your families and get to know your setting and your environment first right. and all of the needs of your children and then you know, prepare mm -hmm. and go from there. Um, it's also important to remember that even if really ultimately you're creating accommodations for maybe just one or two children mm -hmm. that have some needs, it may benefit everyone. Right. And it certainly isn't going to hurt. Mm -hmm. So if you decide that you need to do a little reward system for a child who you know, has trouble sitting still, wouldn't everybody enjoy a little sticker or, mm -hmm. or um, you know, token or something in your mm -hmm. classroom? Absolutely. So you don't have to worry that you'd only have to do it for one. There's often a lot of things that we're doing that while your, your target is one or two children, it's, it's going good, to, for, all it's good for everyone. Right. And you will find that it makes things better for everyone, that mm -hmm. all children love a little order and structure and being able to predict what's going to happen next. So mm -hmm. um, don't feel like you're just doing it for one and all of your efforts are going into this one child. Mm -hmm. you will Will really find the benefit for everyone and again you're gonna have then a lot more happy kids who are coming back to you um, every week and for years to come yeah. so there are two concepts that we can use when trying to then figure out okay what do we do mm -hmm. now you know where do we place them what do we do with them so you're gonna decide okay we have to work with what we already have we're gonna keep them in the program we already have but now we need to decide what that's going to look like mm -hmm. with what we know about the child. So there are two kinds of concepts that we can look at, and again, you have this in your packet. The first one is the self-environment child concept, and the other one is nine types of adaptations. So the first, and this has a little visual, if mm -hmm. you'd like to learn it along with me, okay. Rebecca and yes. anyone else watching, is the self-environment mm -hmm. child. child. And that helps me remember. Um, when thinking about how we can adapt things, that's the order, and that's mm -hmm. what's important. It isn't child, me, and then the environment. Mm -hmm. It's important that we look at it in that order of what am I doing, right. what's going on in the environment around me, and then the child. Okay. So we want to do it in that order. Um, so we want to think about what's, our, what's my attitude? Mm -hmm. What could I do differently? Do I need to change my tone of voice? Am I too loud? Am I talking too fast? Am I using sarcasm that they mm -hmm. may not understand? Um, am I giving too wordy of directions? Am I too vague? Mm -hmm. Am I not following through on the consequences I'm setting? Have I not been clear about what our rules are? Um, all of those things are us. <laughs> and honestly, we don't always want to think that it's me. You know, it's certainly something that the child is doing or that the walls are too bright in the classroom. But often we can fix the problem when we just do some self reflection and think about what we're doing. And it helps to have an honest friend or an honest, um, you know, coordinator that would be willing to come in and observe and take a look at things and to offer you some real honest feedback of, you know what, Amanda, you do. You talk too fast and your voice is too high pitched. And I could see how that would maybe be you know, upsetting or frustrating for some of the kids in your right. classroom. So you need to first look at that. And again, this is in your packet, some other ideas to, mm -hmm. to think about. So after you've looked at yourself, the next part is the environment. This is looking at the classroom. Mm -hmm. Does it foster a calm environment or atmosphere? Are there visual reminders or pictures of things for the child? Are there expectations posted for them so they know what to expect? Mm -hmm. Is there soft music playing in the background, if that would be helpful? Think about what the environment actually says and then what that says to the children and then what their behavior is mm -hmm. as a result. Unfortunately, um, I know in our program, we don't have a lot of control over our environment. We're using the classrooms that are for the day school. So we're coming already into these already established second grade classrooms mm -hmm. with bulletin boards and 30 desks and all kinds of really fabulous distractions, right. though, quite frankly. And you might not have a lot of um, control over that. So you need to think about what things you can bring in. Again, no more box. You might be dragging mm -hmm. some things behind you, but you might use create a prayer table space. And here I brought my little candle and, and making a little cloth on one of the desks. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things you can do. Is it a real candle, Amanda, it's, that children can set themselves on fire with? They, I'm glad you asked, Rebecca. <laughs> Actually, no. It's one of those fabulous little tea light 
little votive. This mm -hmm. one has been burning out, but, um, and you put it in there and it actually is real glass though, because we're okay with that. Right. And so again, we just, on a regular desk that's already in the classroom, you can create something beautiful and special, mm -hmm. which is creating that environment that you want, which is, this is a calm, safe right. place to be. You can hold yourself up into one small corner so that you don't have the mm -hmm. whole, um, you know, option of the large classroom. Ask for a partition so that you could maybe block off the teacher's messy desk mm -hmm. or bulletin board that's extra dis distracting. So look at your environment and then communicate with the people that are in charge of that so that they can help you determine what may need to mm -hmm. be done with that. All right, so we've looked at our self, mm -hmm. we've looked at the environment, right. and now we're going to look at the child. And that's the last part is to evaluate the child mm -hmm. because we're just supposed to love on them. They are who they are. And thankfully our job is to not try, as I said before, not to try to change them or diagnose them or do some kind of intensive therapy with them. We're going to accept them as they are, but there might be some something really specific that's happening with them that we need to address. Um, and it might be because of the environment or something that we're doing, but if we look at what's happening with them. So we're going to, of course, pray for them. We're going to pray with them. We're going to laugh. Sometimes we're going to need to cry it out and just work it all out. Um, but it also might be we need some actual tangible things for this particular child to help them get through a session. And not just get through it, right. but make it a joyful, fun. And to really thrive. And to really thrive, mm -hmm. absolutely. So does that take us to the nine types of adaptation? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So we've we've come to the part where we've looked at ourselves. We've made some changes there. We've looked at our environment. Mm -hmm. We may have had to tweak some things there. Now the child really needs us, and we're going to have to do some real live stuff mm -hmm. and that is that's the nine types of adaptations again for me um, I needed a checklist I was only going to get unstuck if I knew okay what can I actually do right. I needed some things to actually do so these nine types of adaptations and again you have this in your packet are things to think about now I would never even consider that you would have to oh I have a child who has Asperger's syndrome and so I have to change nine things that I'm going to do you might, not, might only need to change one or two. And it might always be the same thing. After you get to know the child, you might know, I always am gonna have to give them extra time to work on an activity because they're gonna get so involved and excited in it that they're just not gonna to wanna to stop right away. Or it might be, depending on what the activity is, you're gonna to have to make changes. So if you keep this little handy guide with you, you can kind of look through and say, here's my activity, here's what we're planning on doing today. How will Johnny need to see that? Will he need more time for the activity? Um, will he need me to, to change it in some way? So we have all of our things in here, all of our, our we're taking them out of the box. And again, you might not get to, to all of them, but I did wanna highlight some of them, which is the size. And this isn't necessarily changing the size of the material. Maybe it is enlarging it, right. if somebody needed something like that mm -hmm. visually. But maybe it's, instead of learning the entire Bible verse, they're just gonna learn one line of it. Right. Instead of concentrating on the entire um, you know, Christmas narrative of the three wise men and everyone, they're just gonna talk about or learn about a few of the main characters mm -hmm. and just the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph, whatever it might be. So you might just change the amount that you're giving that child. Right. And again, it might also be the time. They might need more time to do mm -hmm. an activity. And what I find, unfortunately, is sometimes they don't need quite as much time. Right. They're busy and they're moving from one activity to the next. And you think, oh, there's no way I'd get to all six of these things. And it's 15 minutes in and you're done. So drag that bag behind you with lots of different options. Mm -hmm. The other thing that is a common um, adaptation would be level of support. It might be having an extra person in there. It might be another, it might be a peer buddy that they would have just nearby in case they needed some help. Or it might be another catechist or volunteer that you would have sitting in proximity of that child. Again, you're gonna know that because you're gonna know your families mm -hmm. first before you say, oh my gosh, I'm gonna need three extra people in my classroom. And now you're stuck again. Mm -hmm. You're gonna find out who those kids are first and then you're gonna base how you're gonna need to change those things afterwards. Another place, my favorite thing to adapt, or my favorite adaptation is the input, which is how am I going to deliver my message? Mm -hmm. How will they receive it? How is it going to get into them? And I love this because I love stuff, and I love <laughs> all of having all of my props and fabulous things. And again, this is all about unboxing God. Maybe they're gonna need to paint a picture of their favorite 
um, Bible story character mm -hmm. or what the stained glass, their favorite stained glass window in the church that they had just come back from visiting. Um, maybe they're going to make up skits. Maybe they're going to need some things. And I brought something with me, Katie, of course, which you can tell would not fit in my box. And this is my little Noah's Ark. And there are fabulous animals inside and Noah and this, and you can set up the whole mast of the boat. Mm -hmm. And so I was all about, again, the input. Some kids needed to keep their hands busy. This is something that you would just maybe have on the floor while you're reading the Bible story mm -hmm. because kids might need to keep themselves and their little hands and bodies occupied while you do what you would normally do. Mm -hmm. So how are they going to receive the information? And some kids may want to sit and do that over and over again mm -hmm. while somebody reads the Bible story to them over and over again, and that's okay. Right. Our job is to not to push them through some curriculum mm -hmm. that we think we have to get to. Our job is to prayerfully put it out there for them and then get out of the way mm -hmm. so that we can let God and the Holy Spirit do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And really only that child and God will know what they need to get from that. Right. And you might bring the same materials out time and time again, and it will be a different experience for them because we've allowed God to take over and not get caught up in, I have to check off my list of now, okay, Noah's Ark, check off the list, we've right. finished <laughs> that. So, so input is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the busier we keep the kids, the more engaged, um, I'm big on using the multiple intelligences, and that's another area um, that you can kind of explore on your own or I can help people with at another time mm -hmm. of using those multiple intelligences to find out areas of interest for the kids. So if you're keeping it broad and using a lot of different techniques, mm -hmm. you're going to hit on the best input style for, for each all, child. For each child. Mm -hmm. Again, not just these one or two that you have a little info sheet on, mm -hmm. but for every one of your classroom mm -hmm. because we all have a way that we learn best. And if you keep it open, never put that lid on your box again, you're going to hit on everybody's learning style mm -hmm. and keep everyone happy. Um, there are other types as well. We have level of difficulty, as mm -hmm. we kind of touched on that. They might not um, be able to handle all of the material, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. The output as well, instead of wanting to answer out loud, they might want to keep a journal. Also, don't get caught up on if everybody is standing and doing a fun song, they might just want to stay and observe, and that's okay. So that's their level of participation. Don't send a child dragging along to participate. If we are supportive and we create an environment that is safe for them and that they feel comfortable mm -hmm. in, they may eventually participate. Or you know what? Dancing just might not be their thing, <laughs> and that's okay. But if they, don't, if they don't seem upset or worried by that and they would just rather watch, that's okay. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't feel that we have to make every child do every single thing and that they all have to love every thing that we do. Mm -hmm. If we Again, if we keep it broad and we mix it up with lots of different right. types of things, we're going to hit on everyone's. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to worry or then get stuck on, they didn't like that. You know what? You're going to find out what they do like and you're going to try that next time mm -hmm. and that is okay. So um, there might even be the need for possibly alternating the actual goal or even the entire curriculum. You might have a child with some really significant needs that what your current program is or the material that they're going to be you know, doing for that either mm -hmm. lesson or the whole you know, series that you're doing might not be appropriate for them and that's okay. That might be a time though when you say, maybe we do need to look at an, an alternative program mm -hmm. or gathering these children together with some other peers and doing something separate. Mm -hmm. And don't get stuck on thinking, well, if they can't do it, then they just can't participate and that's right. it. You might have to come up with another option, mm -hmm. but that's usually rare. To be honest, you know, a lot of times we can make those adaptations, but there are times when it's just going to be too much mm -hmm. or a family says, I really want them to work on, you know, maybe learning this particular prayer or mm -hmm. understanding this one main concept. And then you need to find a way to provide that and so that we can, you know, work within what the family is wanting and what's appropriate for that individual right. child. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you will have plenty to work with when thinking about all of these different ways to modify. And again, remember that you don't need to do all nine kinds that, again, you get stuck because you can feel overwhelmed. You can figure out that some kids only need one or others may need you know, multiple or mm -hmm. some lessons are fabulous just the way they are and you aren't going to need to do any of it. Mm -hmm. Now here is my tongue twister for the day <laughs> that's going to help us remember. 
prior proper planning prevents poor performance. Mm -hmm. I won't make you repeat it, Rebecca. Thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. But the idea of you have to do this in advance. Mm -hmm. You will feel stuck and you will have your volunteers running for the hills if they don't know what they're expected to do until that morning mm -hmm. because they won't have time to have thought about it in advance to know, oh, I better bring a, you know, something for them to hold on to while we do that. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I have this great puppet that would be fabulous for this activity. You have to plan in advance. Don't be scared though. Once you start to do this and the ball gets rolling, it will be easier and you will know what to do and you can come up with the ideas quicker and quicker right. as you go along. The adaptations will come naturally. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And again, the same adaptation might work time and time again. Right. And so then you won't need to do anything differently, but mm -hmm. you have to start by prior proper planning prevents poor performance. You will be <laughs> happier and you will not feel sad at the end of your lesson with the children if you took the time to think yeah. about it beforehand. That really is, really is important. So you've got these two concepts. You've got self, mm -hmm. environment, child and you've got your nine types of adaptations mm -hmm. and you're going to keep everybody going and they're right out of that box and everybody is is happy and on track yeah mm -hmm. well you mentioned earlier something about being stuck because they might feel like it's not fair to do something for one child and not for the other kids um, how do you address that this is one of my favorite little um, visuals mm -hmm. and I think this is something that works really well not only for the kids but for adults, sometimes we do, we have ourselves, we can feel this way, or we might have a volunteer that gives us a little pushback saying, how can you expect me to do just this one thing? That's not fair for you to say that I have to provide mm -hmm. this kind of accommodation or do this for this child. And I have these 16 other kids in, in this classroom, that isn't fair to do. Um, so we use the idea of going to the doctor and you're all sick with something different, and we'll even let the kids pick what they're sick with. Well, I've got the flu, and I've got strep throat, and I've got pink eye, mm -hmm. and the doctor comes in, and we're gonna do things equally. This doctor makes sure that he keeps everything very equal. So today, everybody is being treated for the scrape on their knee, and so everybody gets a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I have strep throat, so you can start to ask the kids or, or the adults, how did that Band-Aid work for your strep throat? Right. Not very well. Oh. What about your pink eye? How's that working out for you? <laughs> not so well, but that was equal. Everybody got the same thing, mm -hmm. but that's not really fair. What's fair is that I would give you eye drops for your pink eye, you'd get your prescription for your strep throat, and you would get the Band-Aid for your scraped knee. Mm -hmm. Things don't have to be equal, they need to be fair. And as long as every child feels that they are getting what they, they need, need yeah. individually, there isn't gonna be a problem. Mm -hmm. If a child does start to address that with you, then that is a red flag to let you know there's something going on, mm -hmm. self or the environment most likely, that's made, or even the child, that's mm -hmm. making them feel that they aren't being heard or that right. their needs aren't being met or that they're not being treated mm -hmm. fairly. But it's not about equal. It's about giving what each child needs. And unfortunately, it seems like it's the kids who really get this concept yeah. a lot. And it's, us that have a hard time because in our adult brain we think that the kids are going to get worked up about that mm -hmm. but they are very intuitive and they know you know I've never had a kid ask how come she gets that wheelchair and I don't right. they know what one child needs might not be what they need mm -hmm. but again as long as everyone is getting what they need individually mm -hmm. then everyone's gonna be happy they're gonna be treated fairly and we don't have to worry about it right. so I usually use a little band-aid as my visual reminder mm -hmm. that it's fair not equal that's a great point. Yeah, um, I think that's. I think we kind of covered covered all of our covered bases. All. I think we did. We tried. My goal is to help everyone feel mm -hmm. unstuck. We're going to unbox God, and we're not going to get so stuck or scared that we can't do something. So I hope you feel that you have some next steps, that you have some techniques to use. Mm -hmm. There's obviously so much more that could always be covered, but I want to wish everybody the best of luck in your endeavors. And if you ever would like to talk with me or email me or look more into um, ways to adapt material or even looking more into the multiple intelligences. Mm -hmm. My contact information can be found on the Inclusion Fusion website. So best of luck and many prayers to your program. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.